Hello, everybody. Welcome and thank you all for coming for the 10th lecture of our Symposium of Aristotelian Studies. I am Professor Daniel Simona Cimento, the organizer of this symposium and the host for this meeting. As usual, I'd like to thank Faperg and Capes for the financial support and the members of the research groups Pragma, Uzia, and Polyphonia for their academic support. Today, we're joined by Professor David Bronstein, who is delivering our lecture. And to debate his lectures, we have Professor Lucas Anjouan, Breno Zupponini and Paulo Ferreira, Roberto Grasso, and on YouTube, we also have Professor Marta Jimenez. She might join us later. So let me br briefly thank them all for joining us today. And without any more delay, welcome Professor Bronstein to our Symposium of Aristotelian Studies. David, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Daniel. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. And want to thank you, Daniel, in particular for this invita invitation. It's very um, nice to have this opportunity and generous of you to uh, include me in what looks like a great program. So I am going to uh, attempt to share my screen. Um, I'll do that ah, for you. OK, thanks, Daniel. Perfect. So the um, title of my talk is Aristotle's Essentialism and the Structure of Demonstration in the Posterior Analytics. This uh, is, um, my talk is based on a paper that's very long. It's right now about 21,000 words. So I try to distill it to its essentials for the purposes of a 50 minute presentation or so. Uh, as a result though, I'll be skating over quite a lot of detail and texts, but I hope we'll have occasion in the uh, discussion period to go back over um, some of that material that I inevitably a bit superficial with. Uh, I should also point out, in case it's confusing, um, those who are here, here early in the group uh, know this, but I'm uh, hiding from my kids. We're in lockdown in Canberra, in Australia, where I live. And so I'm in our shed, which is why there's somewhat um, unusual background. So not to worry, I haven't moved into a shack in the outback. I'm just uh, trying to get some silence in a different part of our, uh, different part of our house. All right. So let's, uh, let's proceed. Uh, I think this is all familiar to everybody, but it's good just to start on the same page. So this is a paper about demonstration in Aristotle apodexis. And as we all know, uh, a demonstration is a deduction in which the fact stated in the conclusion follows by necessity from the fact stated in the premises, but is also causally explained by them. And we can put that in the terms of Aristotle's syllogistics. So a demonstration is a deduction of the, um, for example, uh, as we see here. And uh, its key feature is that the middle term signifies the cause of the connection between the attribute signified by the major term and the subject signified by the minor term. Okay, so that's what a demonstration is. And uh, here are my specific questions in this paper. So what I'm trying to figure out is what kinds of predication are involved in the premises and conclusion of a demonstration, uh, but of a particular sort, a demonstration of the highest sort. Um, that is a demonstration, both of whose premises are indemonstrable. So Aristotle thinks that, um, there are, that some demonstrations are such that one or both of its premises are demonstrable, but not, not all demonstrations can be like that. Uh, there must be some demonstrations in a science, both of whose premises are indemonstrable. So I'm interested in those and in figuring out what the premises and conclusion look like at the level of predicational structure. Uh, another way to ask that same question is to ask about the nature of the middle term in a demonstration of that sort. So those are two ways in which I'm approaching this material. And what, I'm, what I argue in this paper is that to answer these questions, we need to see that Aristotle is committed in the posterior analytics to three central claims about demonstration. And I'll go through these now. These, these are the centerpiece of my paper. So we're gonna be spending um, a fair bit of time on all of them. So the first is a claim I call essence subject. And this is the claim that some demonstrations are such that the middle term signifies an item that is the essence or part of the essence of the subject signified by the minor term. So a different way of putting that is to say that some demonstrations are such that the cause of the connection being su subject and attribute is essential to the subject. 
The next claim I call essence attribute. So uh, this is the claim that every demonstration is such that the middle term signifies an item that is the essence or part of the essence of the attribute signified by the major term. So we can put that by saying that every demonstration is such that the cause of the connection between subject and attribute is essential to the attribute. And this again is a claim about every demonstration. And finally, there's a claim uh, called per se. This is the claim that every demonstration is such that both premises and the conclusion express per se one or per se two predications. An attribute is predicated of a subject S. So this is just a brief gloss on per se one and per se two that I'll come back to, uh, where in per se one, the attribute is part of the subject's essence and in per se two, the subject is part of the attribute's essence. So uh, in effect, my entire paper is an attempt to convince you uh, or its reader that Aristotle is committed to all these claims and to put them together and to draw out their consequences. And that's what I'm going to be doing over the next um, 45 minutes or so. Um, so let me keep going. And here's a preview of how they fit together. So it follows from essence subject and essence attribute that some demonstrations are such that the middle term signifies an, an item that is essential both to the subject and to the attribute. So it follows if I'm right that there are, going to, there are going to be some demonstrations where the cause is essential both to the subject and to the attribute. And I call these essential overlap demonstrations. And one of my principal arguments uh, that I'll get to towards the very end of the paper is that all of the highest demonstrations in a science are essential overlap demonstrations. So that's, those are their key features. We can translate this into the are such that the major premise is a per se two proposition and the minor premise is a per se one proposition. I'm also going to try to establish that every other demonstration in a science premises are per se two propositions. So one result I'm trying to establish is that there are in, in fact exactly two forms of demonstration in terms of their predicational structure for Aristotle. Essential overlap demonstrations and what I'll call all per se two demonstrations. And what this tells us is I think something important in general about Aristotle's theory of demonstration. So it's a familiar and uh, true claim that the theory is a theory of essence-based causal explanation. But I think to understand it adequately, we need to see that both subjects and attributes have essences for Aristotle and that the essences of both feature in the causal explanations that demonstrations represent. Okay. All right, so that's, um, that's a kind of preview of what's to come. Um, in the same spirit, I wanna introduce at this point what I'm going to try to show and what I think are the two foundational claims in Aristotle's theory. So I've taken you through what I've called um, the three central claims. Uh, in my thinking, it seems to me that there are two other claims that kind of lie behind these. And part of what I'll try to do is to convince you of that. And uh, I'll introduce these claims to the following um, labels. So there's a claim I call essentialism, which is the claim that if P is a per se accident and demonstrable attribute of S, and I'll, of course, say more about what per se accidents are in a little bit, uh, then P belongs to S because of S's essence. Right? That demonstrable attributes belong to their subjects because of their subjects' essences. That I think is one of the most foundational claims in Aristotle's theory and a familiar one, uh, although how exactly to understand it is a matter of some controversy and I'll advance a particular way of understanding it. The second foundational claim is what I'll call why what? And this is the claim that if P belongs to S because of some cause M, then both M and S are essential to P. So while essentialism is a claim about the explanatory role of the essences of the subjects of demonstration, why what is 
a claim about the explanatory role of the essences of the attributes of demonstration. And I, to my mind, these are the simplest ways of formulating the two ideas that animate a good deal of Aristotle's discussion of demonstration in the posture analytics and motivate a good number of his claims. At least that's what I'm, I'll try to show. Um, so just a couple of, yeah, uh, more introductory matter. So here's an outline of what I'll uh, do. I'm going to talk through each of the three central claims, uh, but not in a lot of detail. And I'm not going to present all the textual evidence or even in some cases, very much textual evidence for Aristotle's commitment to them. So that's the work that I do in the very long uh, written version of this paper and I'd be happy to talk more about the evidence uh, in the discussion. Uh, but I want to, I'll need to um, establish certain claims uh, in those early sections, but all with a view to getting to section four and working out in some kind of precise detail the exact structure of demonstration, and especially this idea that there are precisely two forms of demonstration. Um, now, uh, something that may have already struck you, but is important for me to be explicit about, is that I'm focused on demonstration in a pretty narrow sense. So I'm dealing only with demonstrations that are explanatory deductions in Barbara, whose premises are necessary and per se. So that is um, um, explanatory deductions whose premises and conclusions are uh, universal affirmative statements. Now, of course, Aristotle clearly recognizes other kinds of demonstrations or demonstrations that are not um, explanatory deductions in Barbara, whose premises are necessary and per se. So he recognizes uh, negative demonstrations and particular demonstrations and demonstrations whose premises and conclusions are not necessary and not per se. And even he'll use apodexis for non-explanatory deductions. So that's, I think, an important feature, especially Posture Analytics Book One, that apodexis is a broad concept that covers a lot of different kinds of deductions. And what I'm doing is trying to work out the details of the core case, if you like, of apodexis or apodexis in the strictest sense, the sense that I think Aristotle att attempts to articulate in books, uh, in book one chapters, roughly one through six, maybe one through seven. Uh, so that's important to keep in mind. What I say will not um, tell us much as yet about particular demonstrations or negative demonstrations or um, demonstrations that fail to have all of these features. Uh, although I, I do, I am optimistic that my results will carry over um, to some extent. I think that if we can get clear about the core case though, we'll be in a good position to figure out the rest of the details of Aristotle's theory, but I don't try to do that here and I haven't tried to do that yet. Uh, also, just an assumption which is innocuous. If you're worried it's not innocuous, I can come back to it in the discussion and explain why it is. But the assumption is that every demonstration is made up of exactly three propositions, two premises at a conclusion. Aristotle uh, recognizes demonstrations with a finite number of premises greater than two, but um, it doesn't matter for my purposes. It's just a kind of notational convenience. Okay, um, so let's get going. I'm gonna start with uh, essence subject. So um, reminding you, this is the claim that in some demonstrations, the middle term signifies a cause that is essential to the subject. And uh, what I offer here is a possible example a very well-known example from Posterior Analytics 113, one of the few uh, examples of a demonstration we get in the text. So this is the um, famous celebrated uh, non-twinkling planet demonstration. Uh, so you'll see that as I formulated it, which is a, a fairly strict report of the text as we have it, the demonstration doesn't work. It, it, it won't do. The um, major premise is either false or uh, unintelligible. So this is, if you like, a kind of unsanitized representation of the demonstration. But l let's not worry too much about the details of how to fill in the predicate non-twinkling, something like non-twinkling in the night sky, maybe, uh, and so on. And um, 
just note something about the minor premise. So I, I don't offer this as an interpretation of Aristotle's own astronomical theory or even necessarily what exactly he's thinking in Posterior Analytics 113. I just offer this as a plausible claim, which is that the minor premise is definitional in the following sense, that near is predicated essentially of planet or near the term appears in the definition of the thing planet. I do this just as a matter of convenience so that we have some concrete example in front of us, because while uh, we may want to debate whether that's the right way to understand this particular demonstration, I think there's no doubt, and it's completely uncontroversial, that some demonstrations have this feature, that the minor premise is definitional in that sense, that the, um, the middle term is predicated essentially of the minor term. And I'm not going to do the work um, of presenting the evidence for that. It's interesting, given how uncontroversial the thesis is, that the evidence for it is less direct and less um, prevalent, I think, than the evidence for the more controversial claim, um, the claim I call essence attribute, which we'll get to in a bit. Okay, but in, in the written version of the paper, I do, I do go through the evidence. Uh, what I wanna focus on is Aristotle's account of per se accidents because uh, here is a place where I think we can see Aristotle's commitment to this um, thesis, essence subject. So just to remind you, uh, Aristotle is committed to a, a very interesting, quite powerful and um, influential metaphysical thesis that goes something like this. All essential attributes of a subject are necessary attributes of it, but not all necessary attributes of a subject are essential attributes of it. And he calls the necessary non-essential attributes of a subject per se accidents. And he defines per se accidents in metaphysics delta 30 in the following way. And, and this um, text is important for me and I'll come back to it. So he says, something is called an accident in a different way, whichever things belong to each thing per se, cathoto, without being in the essence, without being in the usia. So um, I will, depending on time, come back to that text. All right, there are a couple of texts in particular that I think clearly indicate that Aristotle thinks that some per se accidents are demonstrable attributes of their subjects and belong to their subjects because of their subjects' essences. Um, that in effect is the claim I call essence subject. So here's a text in Posture Analytics 2.13 Unfortunately, it's maybe the hardest passage in the posterior analytics. Um, I don't know, it's got a lot of competition, but it's certainly up there for my money at least. But if you look at the bolded bit, and I'm not gonna attempt anything like an uh, interpretation, but if you just look at the bolded bit, uh, the accidents of the things composed from the indivisibles, indivisibles will be clear from the definitions of the indivisibles uh, because of the fact that the definition and the simple are a principle of everything and the accidents belong per se to the simples alone and through them to others. So um, there's a lot to unpack here and I've tried to do that elsewhere. I think we can kind of get the general sense of, you know, science, we have subjects, they have definitions and those definitions uh, play a role in explaining their accidents. And I think he here means their per se accidents. Here's another text, De Anima 1.1, uh, very well known passage where I think Aristotle says much the same thing. So he talks about knowing the essence is useful for apprehending the causes of the accidents of substances. And I think here he means the essences of the substances themselves. And then he goes on for in every demonstration, the essence is a principle. I think again, the essence of the substance is a principle so that whichever definitions do not enable us to come to know the accidents, I think they're per se accidents and do not even make it easy for us to form a guess about them it's clear that all these are stated in a dialectical and empty matter manner. So here I think, again, getting clear idea that the substances or subjects, I could sometimes call them subject kinds that are studied by a science, you can think here of biology, right? They have definitions, they have essences, and those essences play a role in explaining those subject kinds per se accidents. Okay, um, so. Let me just adjust this for a second. Yep, that should work. I think what we get from these texts is this claim that I've called essentialism. 
I think what Aristotle is saying here is that if P is a per se accident and demonstrable attribute of S, then P belongs to S because of S's essence. Now, what I want to do now is just distinguish between a weak and a strong interpretation of that claim. And I think what Aristotle is wanting us to hear is the weak version. So I think his claim is that some subject kind S's essence is a cause of all, its, of all of its per se accidents. I don't think his claim is that it's the only cause. So if we look at the um, non-twinkling demonstration that I introduced above, the idea is that uh, just as for the sake of argument, if we suppose that the minor premise is definitional in the way that I've suggested, then there are two possibilities for this demonstration. Either near is essential to planet, um, or, um, sorry, let me back up. Um, uh, don't assume uh, as yet for the sake of argument that the minor premise is definitional. So there are two possibilities. Either it is, right? Either near is essential to planet, or this demonstration I've labeled one is part of a series of demonstrations in which we'll have a premise uh, of the form E belongs to all planet, where E is essential to planet, and the minor premise of our original demonstration, near belongs to all planet, is a conclusion. Okay, and I've represented uh, the simplest version of such a demonstrative series below. Okay, so here's what I'm proposing about essentialism. Uh, Aristotle saying that the essences of subject kinds are a cause of their per se accidents. So if we have a demonstration right, where um, we have our subject kind, say, planet, either the middle term will signify an item essential to the um, subject kind, but it need not. If it doesn't, then the demonstration will form part of a series in which there is a demonstration higher up in the series, actually at the beginning of the series, in which the middle term does signify something essential to the subject as we see in the demonstrative series that I've represented here. Okay, um, so that's a way of representing, putting into practice, if you like, the weak version of essentialism that I think Aristotle is committed to. All right, there's obviously a lot more to say about that, but um, as I've said now several times, I'm having to skate over quite a bit of detail and argumentation. But let's, let's um, turn to the next of the three central claims, what I call essence attribute. So to remind you, this is a claim, and this is significant, about every demonstration. It's the claim that every demonstration is such that the middle term signifies an item that is part of the essence of the attribute signified by the major term. So if we go back to our non-twinkling demonstration, my proposal is that in this demonstration, as in every demonstration, assuming the strict conception of demonstration that I'm working with, the middle term near signifies something essential to the demonstrable attribute non-twinkling. So that means that the major premise is definitional. Definitional in the following um, way, non-twinkling belongs to near in such a way that near is essential to it. Or if you like, near appears in the definition of non-twinkling. Okay. So what I'm going to do for this claim, essence attribute, is spend more time trying to establish it on the basis of textual evidence because it's not nearly as uncontroversial as essence subject is. But I, I, in the following remarks, I'm not going to give you all the evidence that I think there is for it. I'm just going to give you a sampling of it. So um, one piece of evidence is Aristotle's claim, which he makes by my count uh, six times in the second book of the Posterior Analytics that in a demonstration, the middle term is a logos of the major term. And it's pretty clear to me that logos in these passages means a definitional account. So we can see this, for example, in the following um, lines from um, chapter 17, the middle term is a logos of the first extreme, that is the major term, which is why all the sciences come about through definition. Okay, so that's one piece of evidence. Um, Aristotle doesn't qualify the claim that in some demonstrations, the middle term is a logos of the major term. It's just a claim he makes about demonstration in general. 
Here's another important piece of evidence. And this is a passage that if we had all the time in the world, I'd um, spend much more time on with you. So this is from a well-known passage from um, Posterior Analytics Book 2, Chapter 2, where Aristotle is, it's in the context of Aristotle's discussion of scientific inquiry. But in the course of that discussion, he makes several very crucial claims, I think, about the nature and structure of demonstration. So uh, looking especially at the bolded bits, he says, uh, the middle term is the ca cause of the substance being uh, not this or that, uh, but without qualification, or, and this is the crucial bit, of its being not without qualification, but someone among the things that belong to it per se or accidentally. Okay, the middle term is the cause of the substance being some one of the things that belong to it per se or accidentally. Uh, then he goes on um, in what I've labeled section B, for in all these cases, it's clear that what it is and why it is are the same. And I think it's pretty clear that the referent of all these cases is at least all cases in which some per se accident is demonstrated to belong to its subject. And then he gives some examples of, the, of this equivalence or sameness of the what and the why. Uh, what is eclipsed? Loss of light from the moon because of the Earth's screening. Why is there an eclipse or why is the moon eclipsed? Because the light is absent from the moon when the Earth is screening. Um, and we get another example about harmony. So I want to say a little bit about um, both parts of the passage, the two parts I've broken it up into. So the first thing is, I think the way to understand the claim that I put in bold is that the middle term of a demonstration signifies the cause of a substance's per se accidents. So I'm interpreting the phrase, some one of the things that belong, or some one among the things uh, that belong to the substance per se or accidentally as referring to per se accidents. It's actually quite tricky, and I'd be happy to come back to this in discussion. So some of the earlier commentators worry about the, the expression per se or accidentally, kathoto e katasubebikos, especially the a, the or. And I'd, I'd welcome some discussion of that. I have some thoughts about it. Um, but that's how I'm interpreting it. Okay. The next claim, uh, so we've established, so this is, this is, important, but not um, altogether um, surprising that Aristotle is saying this, but let's just note he's saying, okay, the middle term of a demonstration signifies the cause of a substance's per se accidents. But he then do, does, for my purposes, very important move of saying something about the nature of that cause. So he says that um, in all these cases, again, referring at least to the cases of per se accidents, it's clear that uh, what it is and why it is are the same. Okay, so what I think Aristotle is saying here is in effect what I'm calling essence attribute. He's saying that for any item P that is a per se accident and demonstrable attribute of a subject S, what P is, is the same as why P belongs to S. Now, why P belongs to S is the cause signified by the middle term in the demonstration of P's belonging to S. So I think what Aristotle is saying is that if what I've given you here is a demonstration, then M is essential, the cause is essential to P. And that's just what I'm calling essence attribute. So this is the sentence that I think establishes essence attribute in all these cases, that is in all cases of per se accidents, the what it is and the why it is are the same. Why the attribute belongs to the subject is the same as what it is. And it follows directly from that that the middle term in every demonstration I think signifies something essential to the attribute. Um, okay. Now, Aristotle adds another claim, I think, in his description of um, his examples. He's less explicit about this claim, but I think that he's committed to it. And I think, as I hope we'll see, it fits well within his broader theory. So I've given you here his two examples. What is eclipse? Loss of light from the moon because of the earth screening. What is harmony? A numerical ratio in high and low. Uh, here's a little text from um, chapter eight. What is thunder? Extinguishing a fire in cloud. What's important and notable about these examples is that it's not only the cause, the middle term, that is included in the TSD of the attribute. It's also its subject. 
right? Uh, moon in the case of eclipse, uh, high and low in the case of harmony, cloud in the case of thunder. So I think what Aristotle is doing, and I think this becomes uh, clear, especially in 2.8 and 2.10, is he's saying that the essence of the demonstrable attribute includes both the cause and the subject to which it belongs. And so this gives sense equivalent. One is the second of the two foundational claims that I introduced earlier, what I call why what. If P belongs to S because of M, then both M and S are essential to P, both the cause and the subject. And we can translate this into a claim about demonstration and definition. So if what I've represented here uh, is a demonstration, P belongs to all M and so on, then M and S are each part of the essence stated in the definition of P. So you can read off from any demonstration two essential attributes of the demonstrandum, of the demonstrable attribute, the middle term and the subject. Okay. Um, so what I've tried to do here, and I'm now gonna to have to pick up my pace a little bit, uh, is to try to get to what Aristotle might be thinking in introducing these very significant uh, claims. Uh, so we can maybe come back to this, but my speculation here is that Aristotle is thinking about the metaphysically fundamental ground of the existence of a demonstrable attribute, that it depends at a metaphysically fundamental level for its, its, its existence, both on its cause and on its subject. And that's why it's appropriate in thinking about what it is, its TSD, to identify both its cause and its subject in the TSD. Okay, let's come to per se now. So this is the claim uh, that every demonstration is such that both premises and the conclusion express per se one or per se two predications. So let's uh, say a little bit more about per se one and per se two. I've given you here the three passages in the posture analytics where Aristotle distinguishes between so-called per se one and per se two. I will not go through them, although there's a bit of uh, text five that if I have time, I'll say something about. But I have them there in case we wanna revisit them in discussion. Uh, I offer here what I think is a, a relatively uncontroversial characterization of what the two forms of predication are. So in per se one predication, A belongs per se one to B, if and only if a belongs to B and A is part of the essence of B or is the essence of B. Whereas A belongs per se to to B if and only if A belongs to B and B is part of or is the essence of A. So in per se one predication, the attribute is essential to the subject. And in per se two predication, the subject is essential to the attribute. In both forms of predication, we have a predication. So we have an attribute predicated of a subject. And I, I don't really, I won't say, I don't think anything more about that in this presentation, but in the written version of my paper, that's a very important thought that subject and attribute in both forms of predication play different and non-interchangeable roles. Okay. Uh, that's a different way of saying that per se predications as genuine predications are not convertible. Okay. Um, so these are also claims that I would spend more time on if I had it, um, but I'll just table them uh, for the interest of our discussion. So I think that per se predication is a relation that is asymmetric, irreflexive, and transitive. Uh, it's asymmetric, so I'll just focus on one form of per se predication, but it applies to both in the following way. If A belongs per se one to B, then B does not belong per se one to A. Right, so that's because of um, a reasonable non-circularity constraint on definition. Uh, similarly, uh, for irreflexivity, there's no A such that A belongs per se one or per se two to itself. And transitivity. So this will play a role in an argument I give later. If A belongs per se one to B and B belongs per se one to C, then A belongs per se one to C and similarly for per se two predication. 
Um, so I also think that per se, um, one and two predication are incompatible with each other in two different ways. And the first is particularly important, I think, for Aristotle's theory of per se accidents. So if A belongs per se one to B, then I think for Aristotle, A does not belong per se two to B. So this again is just in virtue of a standard non-circularity constraint on definition or essential belonging. Okay, and it goes the other way too. If A belongs per se two to B, right, then A uh, does not belong per se one to B. Now, the reason that's important is this text that we looked at in Delta 30, where Aristotle says that A is a per se accident of B, or I think this is what he's saying, I'm paraphrasing, if and only if A belongs per se to B and A is not part of B's essence, it's not an ousia of B. Because I think that this characterization of per se accidents in Delta 30, together with Aristotle's characterizations of per se one and per se two predication, and this incompatibility claim generate a significant result, which is that A is a per se accident of B if and only if A belongs per se two to B. So I'm just gonna leave that hanging uh, the conclusion itself is not novel. So this is a standard view. Um, Breno in his paper on per se accidents, uh, I think endorses it and um, discusses it very helpfully. What I offer here is I think a, a way of establishing it that I've not seen before, but that I think is pretty straightforward. It's just in virtue of the definition of per se accidents in Delta 30 and what per se one and two belonging are together with the incompatibility between them that I think generates this conclusion that all and only per se accidents are per se two attributes of their, the subjects of which they are per se accidents. Okay, but I'm gonna keep going. I, I, that, that doesn't, that's not essential to my argument here, but especially with Breno here, I couldn't resist um, taking a minute or two to, uh, to give that argument. Okay, so let me, now that I've said something about what per se one and two belonging are, uh, more than I strictly needed to, but um, Brazil is, I think, the best place in the world to talk about per se predication. So um, I'm in Brazil in some sense of in, so it seems appropriate to do that. It's the only place in the world where you can walk into uh, a room and just start dropping per se one and per se two, and everyone will know what you're talking about. Um, but so now that I've said something about it, uh, the evidence for the claim I'm calling per se. So the evidence is the opening paragraph of book one, chapter six. There's some evidence in the closing lines of the same chapter, but it's really this paragraph. And like the other texts that I've given you here, I'm not gonna talk about it in detail. I'm just going to summarize what I think is its argument. Um, and in fact, I'm not even gonna go through this whole argument. I'm just gonna call your attention to the fifth step in the argument. This is, I think, his main conclusion in the passage, which is that every premise of a demonstration is a per se one or per se two proposition. Okay. Uh, based on other things Aristotle says in 1.6, I think it also follows that every conclusion of a demonstration is a per se one or per se two proposition. And this basically results from the equivalence Aristotle makes uh, between per se one slash two predication and necessity. That every, all and only necessary propositions, Aristotle seems to be arguing are per se one or per se two propositions. So insofar as a conclusion is necessary, it's either per se one or per se two. And so one six gives us this result, I've stated in eight, that every premise and every conclusion of a demonstration is a per se one or per se two proposition. All right. Um, so we've reached the part of my paper where I'm going to try to put all this together with some degree of efficiency into an account of the structure of demonstration. So here are some results that we have so far. Uh, the major premise of every demonstration is a per se two proposition. Uh, that follows from essence attribute and the nature of per se two predication. Another result is that the minor premises of some demonstrations are per se one propositions. And a 
third result is that the conclusion of every demonstration is a per se two proposition. So putting those together, what we can see is the following. There are eight possible combinations of per se propositions in a demonstration. And so we have the claim per se, every premise and conclusion is either per se one or per se two, that generates eight possible combinations. But the first four are incompatible with major premise. Right? In the first four, so I've just given here a very um, kind of little bit of notation. The first four uh, combinations, the major premise is a per se one predication. But that's inconsistent with the claim that I think I've established, or I've at least tried to, that the major premise is always a per se two predication. Combinations seven and eight are incompatible with the claim that every conclusion is a per se two predication, per se two proposition. So the result is that only combinations five and six are demonstrations for Aristotle. And so this is a result I flagged at the beginning, um, a claim I'll just call demonstration. Every demonstration is either an essential overlap demonstration, so that's um, six, or an all per se two demonstration. That's five. All right. Let me say something about essential overlap demonstrations. This may be all that I'm able to do. I, I may just leave um, some of the rest of the material. So um, I've given you here just an abstract form of what such a demonstration looks like and what its different um, uh, claims are saying. So the major premise is saying that A belongs to all B and B is essential to A. And the minor premise is saying that B belongs to all C and B is essential to C. And the conclusion is saying that A belongs to all C and C is essential to A. So what we can see here is that A belongs to all C because of B, which is essential both to A and to C. So it's an essential overlap that is um, we can detect in this demonstration. So let me um, try to make this a little bit more concrete. So let's just assume for the sake of argument that the minor premise of the non-twinkling demonstration is definitional in the way I suggested. So what we can see here is that near and planet are essential to non-twinkling and near is essential to planet and non-twinkling is not essential to planet in the conclusion. Here's maybe a more interesting example from the parts of animals. So here we demonstrate wing of bird through uh, flying. So what this is saying is that flying and bird are both essential to wing. Wings are defined as, say, the instrument for flying in birds. And flying is essential to bird, and wing is not essential to bird. Okay, so uh, here it's important to be clear that flying is not defined in terms of wing. Right? That's something that's important that this demonstration is saying. Rather, wing is defined in terms of flying. And I actually think that's consistent with Aristotle's hylomorphic theory in his biology, according to which form is explanatorily prior to matter. So it's not that flying is for the sake of wings, it's that wings are sort of the, for the sake of flying. So we shouldn't define flying as an activity that, say, makes use of wings. It's rather wings should be defined as bodily instruments that facilitate flying. And looking at the predicational structure of the demonstration, that's, I think, what's part of, that's a way of um, thinking about what's revealed here. Okay. Um, let me offer just a quick thought about the other kind of demonstration, all per se two demonstrations. Uh, so I've just pulled out well-known examples from book two, and I would make the case if we had more time that all of these are cases of all per se two demonstrations. But I want to move past them to a claim that I started with that is really my kind of central question um, in this paper is about the highest demonstrations in a science. And... Um, I think that all of the highest demonstrations in a science are essential overlap demonstrations. And 
I want to now quickly in the last couple of minutes that I have tell you why I think that. So here are uh, some things that we know. So I've tried to establish this claim that there are exactly two types of demonstration. Now, the minor premise of every all per se two demonstration, I think, is demonstrable. If that's right, and I'll say why I think it's right in a second, then no all per se two demonstration has two indemonstrable premises. And it follows then that all of the highest demonstrations in a science are essential overlap demonstrations. So the key claim here is that in every all per se two demonstration, so going back here, all of these, the minor premise is demonstrable. That's a necessary feature of every demonstration of this sort. Now, why is that? Well, it goes back to this claim I've called essentialism. Um, the idea is this. Suppose that the minor premise of this all per se two demonstration is indemonstrable. Well, in that case, it's not true that the attribute P belongs to its subject S because of S's essence. And that violates essentialism. So what we will find in every case of an all per se two demonstration is a minor premise that is demonstrated elsewhere from ultimately an essential overlap demonstration. Right? So a different way of putting this is to say that every all per se two demonstration is a member of a series that begins with an essential overlap demonstration. And where a conclusion in that series is the minor premise of the original demonstration. Okay. State a little bit more generally, the claim is that every all per se two demonstration is explanatorily um, grounded in an essential overlap demonstration. We're always going to take the minor premise and trace it back to a demonstration in which the subject's essence is the middle term. Um, okay, so Daniel, let me check in with you quickly. We're, I see we've been going for 47 minutes. Would I be able to take the next three just to get to the 50 minute mark? Of course, feel free. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks, Daniel. That's, that's what I'll aim to do is to stop at the 15 minute mark. Okay, this is um, more controversial than I'll be able to deal with in the next two minutes or so. But one question you might have is why there are no all per se one demonstrations. So for example, why this is not a demonstration, demonstrating perception of human through animal. Humans um, have the capacity for perception because they are animals. And what I think this demonstration does is it violates a claim that I think Aristotle is committed to, which is that every per se one proposition is indemonstrable. Now, uh, what is the argument for that claim, which is an important and controversial one? So uh, here I'd want to, if we had more time, look at part of the text in 1.4, where Aristotle discusses per se one predication. Oh, what he does there is he gives different characterizations of um, A, the predicate's relation to B, the subject, and its essence. Okay. What I think we can see, so this is the long argument uh, for my claim, uh, is that if a belongs per se one to B, then A is in the Uzia of B. But remember how he characterizes per se accidents in Delta 30. Right? That's an attribute that belongs per se without being in the Uzia. So if A is a per se accident of B, then A is not in B's Uzia. Right? But if A belongs per se one to B, then A is in B's Uzia. So I think it follows that if A belongs per se one to B, then A is not a per se accident of B. But I think that if A is a demonstrable attribute of B, then A is a per se accident of B. And I think from that we get the result that no demonstrable attribute is a per se one attribute of its subject. Right? Because no per se one attribute of its subject can be a per se accident of that subject, just in virtue of what per se one belonging is and what it is to be a per se accident. And that's why I think that um, no per se one proposition is demonstrable. So 
you can say that humans are capable of perception because they're animals, and that conveys some kind of explanatory force, but it doesn't rise to the level of a genuine demonstration for Aristotle, I think. Okay, um, I had some more to say about per se accidents. The crucial thought here is that some per se accidents are indemonstrable attributes of their subjects because some per se two propositions are indemonstrable. And so that since every per se two attribute is a per se accident of its subject, some per se accidents are indemonstrable attributes of their subjects. And that's an important result. So it contradicts things I've said before, for example, that every per se accident belongs to its subject because of its subject's essence. I don't think that's right. Now, I think rather every per se accident that is also a demonstrable attribute of its subject belongs to its subject because of its subject's essence. So that's a kind of important qualification of the kind of essentialist picture Aristotle has. Um, all right, so what I've done here is just given you uh, the four types of demonstration we have in Aristotle factoring now for the demonstrability or indemonstrability of the premises. Uh, it's not crucial for what I wanted to um, establish in this paper. I'll just close by reminding us of the two, what I've called the two foundational claims, which I think um, together with the machinery of per se predication generate basically all the details of the predicational structure of demonstrations that I've tried to uncover in this talk. So thank you very much for bearing with me through a uh, complicated and um, I hope uh, not overly torturous discussion. And yeah, I'm excited to talk about this with you now. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much, David, for the presentation. Uh, I'm sure you have many questions. Uh, we've had two already here. Uh, the first one's from Breno. Breno, please. Thank you, David, for uh, your uh, your paper is very clear and, and compelling. And uh, I have a, perhaps a, a naive question, but um, in your view, if you have a series of, if you have a demonstration of regress, so a series of what you call per se two demonstrations, the regress will be blocked by uh, what you're calling uh, o essential overlap demonstration, right? So a combination between uh, per se one predication in the minor premise and a per se two predication in the major premise. But that essential overlap demonstration can only block the regress if the per se two predication, which is the minor, which is a major premise, it differs uh, or differ uh, is perhaps is um, Cannot, so the, this demonstration can only block the regress if this per se two predication is indemonstrable, right? So there is a difference between that per se two predication that appears at the top of the demonstrative chain and the other per se two predications that, are, that appear uh, at different steps of the, of the chain because they are all demonstrable, right? So what is exactly the difference between these two kinds of per se two predications and what makes one per se two predication demonstrable and the other one uh, uh, demonstrable because uh, it's, uh, it's it's not very clear to me. Uh, uh, perhaps an example would be helpful uh, mm -hmm. to, to illustrate yeah. that, that difference. Thanks. Thanks, Breno. So actually, Daniel, am I able to get the screen back, or do I need? Yeah. So if I go, um, yeah, back here. So. Um, what I've done here is indicated that there are two, when we factor for the demonstrability of the premises, there are two kinds of all per se two demonstrations. So I, I gave an argument for this, although it went by quickly. Um, the minor premise is always demonstrable in my view, but sometimes I see no reason why the major premise can't in some cases be indemonstrable. Okay, so that's a, an indemonstrable um, per se two proposition. And then as you pointed out, in some essential overlap demonstrations, the major premise will be an indemonstrable per se two proposition as well, okay? So because of what I think of the nature of major premises, anytime a major premise is indemonstrable, we're going to have an indemonstrable per se two predication. 
but we don't always have such um, predications. Uh, uh, we don't, they're not always like that. So often, per se, two predications are demonstrable. And maybe I can see the, the question behind the question, the thought behind the question is that that seems more characteristic of per se, two predications. Because what we kind of want is, or let me put it a different way, that what my interpretation leaves us with is, if you like, unredeemed per se two predications. Where I mean by that, predications where the um, attribute doesn't belong to the subject because of the subject's essence. And so it's the, the predication is not redeemed in that sense in which, say, the demonstrable um, premises of all per se two demonstrations are according to the essentialist theory that I've offered. And what marks the difference between these two types of per se two predication? I don't have an overall general theory about that. I don't, I'm not sure that there could be one. I think for Aristotle, it's just a matter, it's just case by case. It's just a matter of the actual relations between the items. So I don't, I don't have a general answer to your question. I see, I see what you're seeing, which is a significant result and one that I had previously not um, seen before or, or really thought possible. I'd kind of had this view, you know, especially if you think about it in terms of per se accidents, what this means as I was saying quickly at the end that in some cases a per se accident will belong to its subject, but not because of that subject's essence. It'll belong to it immediately and without an intervening cause. Those are the indemonstrable per se two propositions, the major indemonstrable major premises. So I don't have a lot to say about those at the moment, um, but I'm, you, you've noted an important consequence of my interpretation. Um, okay, let, uh, let me try to, uh, to ask uh, something, or at least a more concrete version of, of the question. So usually uh, in typical examples of uh, demonstrable uh, propositions in our Aristotelian science are such that, such as a, a triangle have internal angles equal to two right angles and so on. And this is a, can be taken as a per se two relation in the sense that we have a subject attribute at least a clear subject attribute relation in which the subject is part of the definition of of uh, of the uh, of the predicate. So it would be the S term in your uh, different uh, formulations that you use through the paper. So not the M term, but the S term, right? Uh, but in your view, it seems that uh, when P belongs to M, so uh, in a proposition in which uh, the attribute is said to belong to its cause, we also have a, a per se two predication, right? So I have two kinds of per se two predications. One in which the, the per se two predicate belongs to its proper subject, and the other in which the per se two attribute belongs to its cause, right? Uh, and I was wondering whether this is helpful uh, in a way. So is, uh, is it the case in your view that the second kind of per se two predication is indemonstrable, whereas the first one is demonstrable? Uh, so what I mean by that is, so this, all the major premises in those several demonstrations in posterior analytics uh, two, book two are they in the multiple or the multiple in your view? So that yeah, would be so, helpful to understand a little bit in a more concrete way. The... Yeah, so I'll, you're you're alluding to these um, this list here. Yeah. Is that right, Breno? Yeah. yeah. So my view is that um, they could, the major premises in all of these could be demonstrable, but they could be indemonstrable. And that there is no abstract consideration to determine it either way. It's just has to be determined case by case about whether there in fact is a cause of say the connection between eclipse understood as a certain loss of light and screening of the sun by the earth. Um, I mean, 
it looks like in all of these cases that you would expect that there is some cause and so that these are demonstrable. Um, but according to my interpretation, eventually we need, we will need some indemonstrable uh, per se to connection in the major premise. So at some point we'll get a major premise that looks just like this, but where the connection is indemonstrable. So I don't, Um, I don't, I don't know that the distinction between a per se attribute that is predicated of its cause versus predicated of its subject is going to be the key to unlocking the distinction between indemonstrable and demonstrable ones. Because sometimes a per se to attribute will belong to its cause and there'll be a demonstration of that. And in that case, there's a sense in which its cause is also its subject. And it has a plurality of subjects. In fact, a plurality of subjects in those cases in which it can be demonstrated to belong to. Now, I think we can think about, you know, the, it's having a sort of primary subject. Right? And the, you know, the paradigmatic example of the angle sum theorem for triangle is like that. Um, but there too, I'm not, and all of those will be demonstrable, and and, and so we we that's 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 fine, that's good. Um, but when when it comes to the attributes being predicated per se to of its cause, yeah, again, uh, we're going to have both possibilities, and I don't see any kind of abstract theoretical way of 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 determining um, which or or what what all the demonstrable ones have in common, what all the indemonstrable ones have in common. I think that this is a case where the theory of demonstration we, we give has some limitations and that it has to be put in practice in order to see how it actually all works out. So it'll be just a matter of explanatory practice to determine. And in fact, so this is a way of thinking about a result of this. Uh, what this means is that there are propositions in Aristotle's theory that are indemonstrable without being indemonstrable in virtue of the kinds of predication that they are. You know, that's a, that's a way of thinking you, that you might get from the posture analytics. Oh, it's, you know, it's something about the very kind of predication that it is, the kind of predication that it is that makes it indemonstrable. I think that's true of per se one predication, but I don't think it's true of per se two predication. So what this means is that there are going to be propositions in a science whose indemonstrability is something you can determine only through inquiry and only through explanatory practice and not can't be read off from its predicational structure. And those will be the indemonstrable per se two propositions. What it also means is that in, just at the kind of epistemic level, a science will be sort of, I think, un, always in an unfinished state because there's always the possibility, I think, that some cause will be newly discovered of some allegedly or previously thought to be indemonstrable per se to proposition. So that, that's, that's, that's a different way of thinking about Aristotelian science than it's maybe sometimes used to in certain interpretations of the posture analytics. But I think it's the interpretation that my reading is, is, is committed to. Fair enough. Thank you, David. Thanks, Breno. Lucas, it's your turn now. Okay, thank you, Brian. Uh, thank you, uh, David and uh, Daniel. Um, I have serious problems with my internet connection. I had and I still am having them. So if I just uh, uh, lost connection and you can't hear me anymore, please uh, do something with your hands to let me know. And I, I lost something in the beginning, the very beginning of your talk. So sorry if it's a kind of a repentance. Um, so you're back now. So can you hear yeah. me now? Yeah. I wonder, okay. Lucas, if it's worth trying to turn your video off. If, uh, maybe. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Let me try. So uh, my question is this, David. Uh, actually, what you have said to Breno right now in the, the end of your answer is very helpful. Because the question is, 
uh, more a general question about the the import and the significance of what you're doing to understand the the key notion of uh, uh, demonstration as an explanation by primary cause in, in the posterior analytics. Well, the question is pretty much like this. So um, you are kind of uh, checking all possible combinations of per se predications in the three propositions of the, the demonstration, right? assuming that the demonstration has a, a syllogistic expressions, just this three sentences. And then um, I think what, what you have what you have done is quite useful, very, very uh, good, and make some progress in the in the discussion. But then I wonder, uh, what is your reaction if you face a question like this? So uh, do you think that Aristotle is trying to um, inscribe or to put or encapsulate into the notion of per se uh, predication all that is needed to uh, get the notion of uh, demonstrative knowledge as uh, knowledge that comes from knowing the cause and that the cause has also some requirements. It's not just any old cause, etc., etc. Another way of phrasing the question is this. Um, suppose we, we can have a, a, a syllogism or a demonstration or putative demonstration in which all those requirements about uh, the per se predication are met. So we have a demonstration in which the conclusion is uh, per se two of the right kind, then we have uh, per se one and per se two of the right kind in both premises in none of the ways in which this is allowed. But there is also the question, well, is this enough to uh, ascertain us that we are there, namely that we uh, have reached the, the, the most uh, appropriate explanation for what we want to explain. Uh, and then uh, when you answering uh, Breno's question at the end of, of your uh, question, things were more clear to me. And I think that your inclination is to say, no, we have to do, um, uh, not, not we, but the experts, the scientists, experts, according to our sort of have to do more in the, um, more specifically, investigatory inquiry uh, work uh, into the causes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I wonder if if I get your suggestion right. So this, so to put it uh, in a nutshell, um, uh, it might be something about the causal explanation that is still uh, left out of all this talk about predication. That is uh, the the one that. The thing I want to, to hear you about. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Lucas. So I think what I inclined to do is to distinguish between a epistemic version of your question and a non-epistemic version of your question. And I'm not sure what you're asking, so it would be useful to talk about more details. So the non-epistemic version is this. Are you saying that if you, let me just move to a different, um, uh, if I can get a um, right. So, um, are you saying that if you have a, we can, it's maybe even easier to, yeah, take the abstract case. So, the non epistemic version of your question, I think I would understand to be this Are you saying that if you have two premises of the form, A belongs per se two to all B, and B belongs per se one to all C? Is it guaranteed that they will combine to form a demonstration whose conclusion is A belongs per se two to all C? And my answer is yes. So that's guaranteed. Right? But it's a non-epistemic version of the question because it hasn't said anything about our attitude to the premises, the extent to which we do or do not grasp them as supplying the causal explanation of the conclusion. My assertion, again, in the non-epistemic register, is that two premises of that form are guaranteed to supply the causal explanation of the conclusion, okay? Um, especially assuming they're both indemonstrable. Okay, let, let's assume that. If they're not, then they will combine with the, the relevant series of demonstrations that they form part of. The epistemic version of your, so my answer is, is yes uh, to that, it's guaranteed. The epistemic version of your question, I think, is this. 
if I know that A belongs per se two to all B, and I know that B belongs per se one to all C, do I succeed thereby immediately, and if you like, automatically, in understanding that those two premises explain fully and appropriately, again, assuming they're indemonstrable, the conclusion A belongs per se mm. two to all C, or just A belongs to all C. And there, I think my answer is no. So I, I'd, I'd want to think more about this and what grasping causes as such in Aristotle consistent is not an easy, an easy thing to determine. But I don't think it's generated automatically by grasping the per se connections among the relevant terms. I think there more needs to be done. So I'm not, I'm not sure which of the two questions you had in mind, but you can see my answer is yes in the non-epistemic and no in the, in the epistemic case. Does that help? Well, it helps, but uh, I had in mind the non-epistemic version. You um, did? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, well, what I have in mind is, I don't know, I don't know if my question was exactly clear about what exactly I'm, I wanted to put it in the table mm -hmm. to discuss. But the, the question is, so um, so we have a, a given term, a given major term, which is related to the uh, minor per, per se two, and it's a legitimate demonstrable. What I want to know is if um, what is enough, and non-epistemically, but in, the, in, this, in this version of the question, which non-epistemically, what is enough to say that the B term is grasping exactly uh, the right kind of per se one connection to C and the right kind of per se two connection to A. Uh, because I can, I can uh, imagine a middle term B to explain this explanandum, the same explanandum, which is uh, per se one connected with C and it is somehow connected per se two with A, but nonetheless it fails at being the uh, exactly the cause of what I want to explain in the conclusion. It's just, uh, just the question is this, it has nothing to do with yep. the epistemic access, etc., etc. So that, um, which is uh, maybe the equivalence is not uh, so clear, but I think it's, this is equivalent to ask whether this uh, machinery of per se one, per se two are enough to map exactly what is required in the level of the premises to have uh, the the real world factor out there in the world that explains the explanandum that conclusion at stake in the most appropriate way that's the, that's my question let us leave the yeah. epistemic yeah yeah great um, aside it's useful as well but no the non-epistemic version is the, i think the more interesting version of the question so I would need an example. And we've had some discussions of this before, Lucas. So I, I, I can see your clarification is very helpful, but I can see where you're coming, especially from your, re your reading of 1.9. But my view is that the, per se, the, the machinery of per se one and two predication is sufficient to generate the right causal relations. That, as I said before, if we have a demonstration of this form, we have here, then it's guaranteed that B will be the cause. But I'd be very interested to see a counterexample. Um, I don't know if you have any particular one in mind. I don't, so. Okay. No, no. okay. Okay, but that's a good, uh, you know, that's a good inquiry, right? To try to find some case that conforms to this predicational structure, but fails to be, um, explanatory. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it could be helpful for me to say a little bit more about this, which is specifically with essential overlap demonstrations. So one thing that I, I, I don't want to say, and I don't think is that the, it, that this succeeds in being a demonstration because there's an essential overlap between the attribute and the subject. And the reason for that is that there are 
Aristotle's universe contains all kinds of points of essential overlap that don't generate any kind of explanation. You know, fish and birds are both animals, right? There's an essential overlap between them, but there's no, it doesn't generate any kind of explanatory causal relation between fish and birds. Uh, so it's not, I'm not saying that, but I don't think that that's what you're targeting, targeting in any case. But what I am saying is that um, if three items stand in these relations to each other of per se one and per se two belonging, then yeah, it's, it's, that's, that, that is not the same as there being in this explanatory relation. This is where it becomes hard to maybe distinguish the epistemic and the non-epistemic versions of the question, but it's sufficient to generate the explanatory uh, relation. It's just, it's guaranteed that this will be an explanatory deduction. Uh, Whereas I know you think that um, more needs to be built in. We need more machinery about the appropriate specific cause and so on. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm inclined to think that, uh, as you know. So, but uh, the, another way of uh, expanding the same question is: what if two middle terms satisfy the same requirements? So you have two causes for the same phenomenon. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm not too good at thinking examples yeah. uh, out of the blue. See, <laughs> but mm -hmm. uh, I can figure mm -hmm. out some examples. So that would mm -hmm. be uh, a challenging, yeah. pressing question for. For okay, good, no. good. Yeah, thanks, Lucas. So that would be another great example to find. I can't think of any either. Here's something else I can say that's maybe helpful. Although lately I've been having some doubts about this thesis, but it's, um, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll present it because I, I, I do think if I had to choose, I would, I would go with it. Um, it's not something I talked about, but if I had more time, I would talk about, which is that I think there's a very important um, metaphysical asymmetry between the two, what I've been calling the two foundational claims in Aristotle's theory. So this is um, a why, what, and essentialism. And this asymmetry between the two claims, I think maybe helps, you, you would, would maybe satisfy you to some extent, because it, it means there's an important difference between the role that per se two predications play in demonstrations and the role that per se one predications play. So we look at why what, if P belongs to S because of M, then M and S are essential to P. So what I read that is saying is that M and, M, so focus on M in particular, the cause, it's essential to P because it's the cause of the attribute. It's not the case that it's the cause of the attribute because it's essential to it. It goes the other way around. And what that means is that the predication is a per se two predication because the subject in the predication is the cause of the attribute. It's not the case that the, the, uh, the item is the cause of the attribute because it's a per se two predication, if you see what I mean. In the order of kind of metaphysical explanation, the causal relation is the primary thing. That's what generates the essential relation. And therefore that's what generates the per se two connection between them. Um, I think maybe that's already enough to, to, to move a step or two in your direction. So I don't think I need to say this, but I'll just say this to fill it out. I think it goes the other way around when it comes to the essence of a subject. I don't think that near, let's say it's essential to planet is essential to planet because it's the cause of non-twinkling. I think it's rather the cause of non-twinkling because it's essential to planet. Okay, so and if, if that's an example of a genuine um, essential overlap demonstration, again, I'm not, I don't need to claim that it is, but um, um, then this is what it'd be saying, right? Because near causes non-twinkling, near is essential to non-twinkling. And because near is essential to planet, right? That's part of the story of why it causes non-twinkling. Uh, so I think especially what I want to say about per se two predication is congenial to your to your view, right? It's not like and at the it does it is useful to look at the look at epistemically. It's not like there's some method by which we find all the per se two predications, right? And then a method by which we find all the per se one predications, 
and then put them all together and we have our demonstrations where those methods don't look at causes or don't look for explanations, right? It doesn't work that way, at least I think for per se two predications. We discover them by doing explanatory reasoning, by doing explanatory inquiry. And so it's the explanatory connection between the two items that determines their per se connection, not the other way around. Does that help? That's very helpful. So I think this, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, yeah, no, keep going. I, I, I want to add w one complication to that, but I'd be ha happy if you had more more thoughts. Uh, no, I think it's, there's more people waiting for, for questions, and uh, I have different question myself, and maybe we should uh, move. Uh, I don't know okay. what you think. <laughs> sure. I'll just throw this out there, though, and it'd be great, Lucas, you and I can maybe talk another time, but there's a text mm -hmm. in, in Postgres Analytics 216 that bothers me in this way, because there he's talking about the eclipse demonstration, and he's pointing out, to be a familiar passage to many people, that you, know, you can... Um, you, it looks like you can infer the cause from the effect and the effect from the cause. So which of the two, it's the same point about the non-twinkling demonstration, which is the genuine demonstration. And what he seems to say there is that the one, the demonstration we're familiar with where screening is the middle term, that's the demonstration because there is a per se connection between the terms. And that makes it seem as though it's per se connection that determines the explanatory relation rather than the other way around, as I've been suggesting. Now, it, there, there's maybe a way of reading those lines epistemically so that that's not exactly what he's saying. But anyway, I'm, I, I shouldn't complicate matter, matters further. I, I just, that, that's, the, that's the seed of doubt that's been planted in my mind about what I was saying before is, is those lines in particular. Okay, that, that's. I think it's, that's very complicated, and uh, my 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 views about this has to do with uh, how our software is using a lot of those expressions which are important in this story, like hipparchy and catalto. I think this will lead us too far away. Maybe it's best yeah. to, to move on. With this I think so. Yeah, we don't have the text. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Lucas. Thank you. Okay, so I have two more questions uh, for you. One's from Paulo Ferreira, which is the next one, and then Mariani Oliveira is in the audience in your YouTube. She has a question for you also. Paulo, please, your question. Thank you so much, David, for your presentation. Hi, Paulo. Thank you. Uh, I hope you all can hear me. Uh, your presentation was uh, both enlightening and stimulating. And my question is more general, but it's somehow connected to uh, this dis discussion about the uh, machinery of per se one and per se two predication. Uh, I'll use the example uh, that you gave us uh, of the uh, wing syllogism, the conclusion of mm -hmm. which is wing belongs per se to, to all birds, right? Um, uh, uh, which uh, is uh, an instance of what is uh, called in the literature the uh, homonymy principle, right? I mean, in, in the sense that uh, wing is said of, of bird and, and bird is part of, uh, uh, of, of the essence of wing in the sense that only a wing that belongs to a live animal is a wing, properly speaking. And uh, it's only by homonymy that a wing that does not belong to a, a live animal is called a wing, right? Um, uh, my question is, is the following. Uh, you give us uh, reasons, uh, uh, sufficient reasons, to see uh, a per se two predication there in the conclusion, uh, in the sense that well, uh, you cannot have a, a per se one predication there, and uh, uh, the conclusion has to be a necessary uh, proposition, and therefore it has to be a per se two uh, predication, right? But um, my question is about the connection between uh, the structure of demonstration as you have presented uh, to us, and uh, uh, a philosophical principles such as the harmony principle, namely, um, is, uh, the, is a reflection uh, uh, about the structure of demonstration that leads Aristotle to uh, a philosophical claim such as the uh, homonymous principle, as uh, we can see uh, in that example, or rather the other way around, something like um, is a, a philosophical commitment to uh, a homonymous principle on other grounds that leads Aristotle to formulate uh, a, a structure of demonstration that 
um, provides uh, a justification for that. So uh, that's my question. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks, Paolo. So you're right to invoke the homonymy principle here. And I hadn't thought of it in that connection before, but uh, it's a natural one to make. So thank you for that. Um, it, it, it's definitely connected to where my discussion with Lucas ended. And I think I'm inclined to say some of the sorts of things I was saying then, which is look to me like the homonymy principle would come first and then would help generate something like the, the per se two relation. Uh, so the, the general idea would be something like these relations of per se one and per se two kind of regiment and codify certain relations um, that exist um, on different grounds and for perhaps a number of reasons and, and that admit of different sort of justifications and, and arguments. So they would be kind of parasitic on the properly philosophical work rather than generating that philosophical work in the first place is how I would be inclined to think about it. Um, yeah, the performing, as I said, a kind of regimenting and codifying function uh, more than anything else. Does that, is, is that kind of in line with, with what you were thinking? Yes, exactly. That was precisely the point. Thank you so much. Yeah, great. Thank you, Paolo. So we have now uh, one question from the audience, and then Lucas has one more question too. So Marianne has a question. Uh, it's a bit long. Let me find the beginning. Here it is. I'll put it, I'll put it up on the screen. We can read it together. Okay. So she said, thanks, I would like to know if you think that it's also possible to utilize the complement of demonstration, structure explanation, the so-called intents from demonstration proceeds. And it continues, since it seems to complement the person's discussion in a more logical and structural formal way to show the revelation of causal explanation. And there's more. Okay. Reading the preceding discussions to establish a more material explanation on causality and necessity on demonstrations, but that is, that is on my reading following other scholars. And she makes a correction, I think it's up with, uh, I think it's posterior is 110. Okay. That is it. Right. So um, this is the passage where Aristotle talks about the different things from which demonstration proceeds, I think Mariana is asking about. Let me just. Um, I have, um, might have the passage that she's thinking about here in another document. Um, okay. Just bear with me. Um, so one seven. Uh, no, maybe not. Uh, yeah, maybe actually, I, I think maybe the easiest thing is if Mariana gave us the lines in 110 that we could maybe look at together. I think that would help me just uh, figure okay. out where she's coming from in her question. I, yeah. I don't know what, what you're able to do on your end, Daniel. If yeah, you're able to. She, she has a little bit of a delay, I think, between our, our asking and they, they getting the message on YouTube. So maybe we'll come back to her question because it would be kind of complicated to put the 110 passage here. I'm not sure how she will manage to do that. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, I also wonder, is there a way for you to, it was just hard to follow her question just because it, the way it was coming up on my screen it was sort of divided into blocks. Is there yeah. a way for you to... Um, to copy it uh, all? I'll try. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll try to do that on, uh, on, the, on YouTube. Okay. Uh, I'll try to that. So let's move on. We'll come back to her question. Lucas, uh, your question, okay. please. Thanks. Uh, hi, Dave. Uh, you, you yourself has suggested that we can discuss with more time uh, 90A and 911, uh, that passage in which Aristotle says that, uh, uh, well, oh, yeah. 
there is a course about haplos, blah 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 blah. So uh, yeah, as you as you suggested, I couldn't resist. So because this is one of the the most difficult uh, passages. So there's a lot of <laughs> of <Yeah>. concurrence here. <laughs> but um, uh, so uh, I would like to hear. Well, how do you think of this? Uh, Catastrophe because in line 11, because it's the mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. pre obvious, most obvious ways of dealing with this uh, preliminary, at least, is to think that it is opposing uh, the idea of catal tour connection, and then you have this catal because connection. But that mm -hmm. couldn't be because for Aristotle, uh, presumably, or maybe we should say <laughs> for sure. Uh, accidental connections are not uh, scientifically knowable, so he cannot mm -hmm. be making a reference to accidental connections, strictly speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I, I would like to hear you about it, because uh, one possibility uh, that came to my mind, not that I take this seriously, I'm defending something behind this, but one possibility that sometimes crosses my mind is that... Um, uh, look at the example in um, uh, Posterior Analytics 2.11 uh, for the mm -hmm. efficient cause. It's a mm -hmm. historical event in the past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, it has some... Uh, it's very difficult to think about this, that example because um, it's not, of course, universal, but it has at least some uh, requirements about... Um, uh, the the uh, some requirements met for being uh, explainable and knowable in a uh, more demanding way. So I wonder whether sort of with this catastrophe of the cause in line eleven is kind of gesturing towards or flagging towards the possibility that some um, connections that are accidental, at least in some aspect of the connection, might turn out to to show up as being uh, explainable and then mm -hmm. uh, being mm -hmm. explainable they turn out to be subject of a, a scientific treatment so like mm -hmm. like we do with with history for instance mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. another thing is that a, pa a past event is necessary we cannot <laughs> change it mm -hmm. so it has it met this requirement as well <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Lucas. Yeah, so as I indicated, I worried about this phrase. Um, and as I also alluded to, some of the earlier commentators seem to as well. So I found, especially in Zabarella, he has some discussion of A, and he's, he, he's worried. So ideally, Aristotle would have written Chi. Uh, and then that would have been uh, perfect, because he would be saying that the middle term is the cause of the substance being some one of the things that belong to it per se and accidentally. That is to say, both simultaneously per se and accidental, the per se accidents. That would be perfect. Um, okay, but he didn't write chi, or at least as far as we can tell, he didn't write chi. So um, what can we do with A? So assuming it means or, um, it's a disjunction, then I, I think the two options are that it's either exclusive or inclusive. I think that it cannot be an exclusive disjunct disjunction because in that case, Aristotle would be, um, so here I think it should be clear to us that these are demonstrable, whatever the phrase is doing, it's referring to demonstrable attributes because he's talking about the middle term being the cause of the substance having some one of these, demon these attributes. But that's got to be a demonstrable attribute because we've got a substance and the middle term, which is the cause of it. Okay, so the trick is how do you extract demonstrable attributes from that phrase, kathotoe, kathosuma, because? And I don't think you can do that by reading the A dis, um, as an exclusive um, disjunction because then he would be saying that the middle term is the cause of attributes that belong kathoto and not sumbebekos, or attributes that belong kata sumbebekos and not kathauto. But in fact, any demonstrable attribute that is kathauto is also kata sumbebekos. And I would propose, although I see what you're saying about 211, 
that any at demonstrable attribute that's kata suba ve cos is also kata auto. So it, it just doesn't make sense to read this as a exclusive disjunction. So another possibility is to read it as an inclusive disjunction. So it's the cause of some one attribute among the attributes that belong either kathauto or katasubebekos or both kathauto and katasubebekos. So that would get us the per se accidents in the latter group. But the problem with the inclusive reading is that it's, it, it gets us too many. Right, because then it would at least be suggesting that there will be kathauto attributes that are not katasume bekos that are demonstrable, and katasume bekos attributes that are not kathauto that are demonstrable, in addition to those attributes that are both kathauto and katasume bekos that are demonstrable. So I, I'm not so satisfied with the inclusive reading either, although maybe I haven't cared properly characterized how to think about exclusive and inclusive disjunctions here. But assuming I, I've had that, the last thought I've had, and then I'll just mention one more and I'll stop talking about these words, but is that really the importance is the genitive phrase. And that what he's saying is that um, the middle term is the cause of the substance having an attribute among, that will fall among the following set. And all that we need then is for that set to include per se accidents. So even if it includes non per se accidents, accidents or items that are not demonstrable attributes, that's okay because he's not saying that it, the middle term is the cause of any among that set. It's just some among that set. I don't know, that's a lot. Um, that's that's a lot to do with uh, so few words. Uh, a just final uh, possibility, which is maybe a, um, the least likely, but would probably be the, the the simplest, is to say that A really should be understood as a kind of epi epixegesis, right? That it's kathauto, um, by which I mean katasumbebekos. So those kathauto attributes that are of the ketasumbebekos type. So substitute um, uh, IE for or. You know, and this and is something that's sometimes said, you know, Aristotle will use A in this epic sugetic way. Um, and there's the debate in, of course, about Posterior Analytics 219, whether he's using A there in that, in that way. But um, that, that's, that's a final possibility. I don't know. I mean, he's, he, he uses the same word um, two other times in the same sentence where it's clearly has a disjunctive uh, force. So uh, look, maybe it's still linguistically possible, but it seems to me a little bit unlikely, but that that's maybe the simplest solution. So th those are the, that's, that's as far as my thinking has gone. Okay. I uh, think so in this last suggestion, I find it very, very good. And I entertained it myself many times. So the, the thought is that Katasimi because then would be used in a more loose way, at least loose way, not in the sense of accidental connection, but in the sense of not belonging to the essence. Is that what you have in mind? Like yeah, the, that's right. Yeah, that's right. So he's saying, yeah. you know, the ones that belong kathauto, but but not kathauto in in that one way, kathauto in in the other way, not exactly, mm -hmm. essentially per se too. Yeah. Okay. Basically. Okay. That's yeah helpful. And. I mean, maybe that's what, in the end what I should do because what I believe is that when Aristotle introduces the expression kathauto um, sumbebekos in one seven mm -hmm. um, for the first time, you know, and, and and this is a common complaint, right? What does that mean, right? He's been contrasting kathauto and katasumbebekos, right? Uh, so what is he doing there? And then in one four, why does he make life so difficult for us by not saying which of the types of per se belonging he means when he later talks about katasubimbekos? And my own, the view that I've come to, and it's really through reflection on that thesis I was calling incompatibility one between per se one and per se two predication, is that Aristotle thinks it's just totally obvious that per se two predication is sumbebekos, is accidental. 
right? Because if A belongs to B and B is essential to A, then of course A is not essential to B, right? What could be more obvious, right? Because if, if it were, then it would be, the definition would be immediately circular in a way that is just obvious, uh, Aristotle obviously won't accept. So I think that when Aristotle introduces the phrase kathato sumbebe kos in 1.7, I think he, he just means us to already hear that as, as meaning um, kathato in the second sense that he's introduced in 1.4. And so if that's right, if there's this kind of um, immediate uh, connection between kathato, the combination of the words kathato and sumbebe kos, with per se two predication, then maybe this phrase here in two two can help us. You know, it, 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 it's maybe a little bit clearer. It's it's just, yeah, I'm talking about cathode two cathode two predicates, but the the sumbebe cost ones, right? Remember the second the second type. That that's that in any way is is how I I I I'd, I'd pursue the epicegetic reading of e rather than the disjunctive reading. Okay, I think this is preferable to the uh, disjunctive reading. Yeah. Okay, but mm -hmm. we have a lot about this. Uh, probably there are other people in the uh, waiting. Uh, actually, I'm posting here on the private chat, David. If you could switch to that very briefly, uh, the Marianne's question. Okay. Uh, so, let me see how to find the chat. Yeah, the um, private chat's right on. I think it's to the right of your screen. You have comments. Yeah. There comments. we go. Private yeah. chat, exactly. Okay, so great. I put the uh, okay. passage first and then her question. Yep. See, if you, yeah, maybe now. Yeah, great. So I'm just getting to her question now. Um, I'd like to know if you think that it's structure, the so called. Yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah, so that uh, that sounds right to me, Mariana. And maybe Daniel can tell me is I, I don't know about um, Portuguese pronunciation. It would be Marianne or Mariana. Mariani, actually. Ma Mariani. Okay, Mariani. great. Um, okay, so yes, that seems right to me, Mariani. So in the long written version of this paper, I discuss that passage in particular, the opening lines about the three items in a science. And I think that the passage gives us some evidence for Aristotle's commitment to the essentialist claim that I discussed, according to which at least the per se accidents that are also demonstrable attributes of their subjects belong to them because of their subjects' essences. Um, I wonder if you had in mind the rest of the passage, though. Um, so just reading the translation, Daniel's put in the box of so the, the next two boxes after the bit about the three items in a science. There's no reason why some sciences should not ignore some of these and so on. But um, yeah, so I, I, I think I'm with you. I'm not sure about, I'd have to go back and look at Ross and Graham about the more um, material explanation, causality and necessity. Um, yeah, so I, I need to go back and think more about that. So I don't have a lot to say about that now. Um, uh, and then in terms of the hierarchy of principles, I'm not sure if there you're alluding to the difficulty uh, of the common axioms so assuming you are, um, I, it's definitely true that the common axioms don't fit into the interpretation that I've presented here. So if I'm right, then no common axiom will appear as a premise of a demonstration. Assuming, um, this is why, uh, that uh, assuming that no common axiom is a per se one or per se
the two proposition. So that's difficult, and I um, debate about this, and I think there was some effort among ancient Aristotelians to and read the common axioms as per se one or per se two, but I'm I I don't I don't think that works, and so I I am committed to the view as I as I just said that uh, among the kinds of principles that Aristotle distinguishes in one two and elsewhere, uh, it's only definitions that will appear as premises in demonstrations and. Um, not, 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 not the so-called common axioms. So, if if that doesn't exactly address what you were asking, it'd be great if um, you you could follow up um, with a note to Daniel. But that's my that's my initial response. Um, in any case, Daniel, I can hear you. Maybe it's just me, but I'm sorry. Have I been sorry, muted Daniel, for the you... whole? Time? Yeah. Wow. Yes. I'm very sorry. No, I was asking you all if you have any more questions before we close up. No. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. So I've been muted for a long while now. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> thank you very much, David. I'm sorry you all for being gesturing or saying anything. It was very nice to have you with us again, David. Hopefully we'll have you here in presence once this whole crazy thing is over. Um, anyway, thank you very much, so Daniel. And thank you to everybody for your questions and the discussion. This has been a real, real genuine pleasure for me, as it always yeah. is uh, with, uh, with uh, the excellent group that you have in Brazil. Thanks. Thank you very much. And if you... And we hope you come back for the discussions on the other presentations too. So thank yes, you, Brent, great. Roberto, Lucas, and Paulo once again for coming. And bye, everybody. We'll be back soon. We're next. Bye, everybody.